okay, we're back. So, you know, I got to love hanging out with Ben, you know, <laughs> and I get tools. And you guys both know, yeah. if you hand me a tool to measure something, we're bad things are going to ensue or good things. I don't know. It's good, bad, depending upon your perspective. Yeah, relativity. Yeah, that relativity. Be, so, yes. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's good in my world. <laughs> Anytime I, you know he sees something, that's exciting, man. Well, we've always talked about you know if you don't have a measurement, what do you have? A guess. Right. That's Those right. are yeah. the only two options. Mm -hmm. It's digital. Mm -hmm. It's measured or it's guessed. Yep. One or zero. It was, it's so interesting. Already, it seems like it's a recurring theme today that there's all these variations that people have just kind of shrugged off this bad bad parts and mm -hmm. stuff and you know at pri uh you led a wonderful talk and panel uh that i got to watch <laughs> <laughs> talking about these sisters of surface finish because again surface finish it's a huge huge thing and you may have been noticing that these are up on the table yeah. they've been hiding them in plain sight all day for a reason uh so Let's talk about surface finish and the realities of that surface finish by itself isn't the only thing that we need to really think about when we think about surfaces. Yeah, there, you know, and, um, you know, like many things, plagiarism may be the sincerest form of flattery from the ignorant. So I've plagiarized this man more times, you know, and I try to give Mark credit every time I do. But he came up with the idea, he talked about the two sisters, mm -hmm. that there's form and finish. You know, yes. that, that it's the contour and the roughness. You got both the macro and the micro working together. Mm -hmm. And then I just brought one of the sisters that I deal with a lot, which is the metallurgy. Sir, That's the not, ugly stepsister. The, uh, <laughs> <laughs> there are times when she can be a prom queen, be, yes. and there's a time that she's a snuff queen. <laughs> you know, and there's, you know, yeah. You know. Well, that's why I need guys like you <laughs> right, to right. manage her. Right. You know, and she can be made ugly. You can take a real a prom queen and make her real, real ugly with improper tooling. Yeah. In manufacturing, there's a lot of different ways you can hurt a surface. You know, we talked about in our presentation at PRI, you know, about how to improve surface, mm -hmm. the, you know, surface metallurgy, not metrology, metallurgy, yep. in ways that you can hurt it. You know, improving it might be things like shot peening, it might be nitriding, it might be rolling, ways to add compressive stresses. There's also ways to hurt the stepsister. You can grind or burn. You can have rust. Mm -hmm. You can have hydrogen embrittlement. Yes. You know, these things that we deal with my clients all the time is how do we improve surfaces, yet how do we not hurt surfaces? Because you can very easily hurt that surface, like you mentioned, in the mm -hmm. manufacturing per process inadvertently. But, and that's where you don't even know you did it because the top is still the same. Mm -hmm. Or if you check it, it, you only hurt it so, like if you look at this, these mountains and valleys of any surface, mm -hmm. you know, and I don't know how well the camera could pick it up, but these are just, this is like a topo, a topo map. Mm -hmm. Well, just because you hurt it, you may not only hurt it down just a few millionths into the surface. Right. And when you check it, usually you look past there. So you go in here and you look way down here and like, well, I didn't hurt it. Well, yeah, all your hurt damage is right there at the surface level in the first few microns, the first few millionths of an inch. And that hurt you're talking about, though, might be below that skin that we measure with a stylus for roughness. Right. It's just <clears throat> lurking. Yeah, that was one of the slides I showed that, that showed, you know, hey, we're talking about something hurting that's, you know, you know half a thousandths deep. Right. Mm-hmm. But, you know, a when you do a Rockwell C poke, yeah. Yeah. it's going four thousandths into the surface, three, four thousandths deep. Yeah, four thousandths. Right. right. So you've blown through the damage area. And, you know, it was interesting because, um, you know, I talked to somebody who's basically, they have F1 level um, metallurgist. Right. And they're looking at it, and they had a camshaft, and they saw some, some small cracks in it. And the metallurgist is like, well, this wasn't properly tempered. And I went, huh, it wasn't properly tempered. Yes, it, it was heat treated, but not properly tempered. And they said it in a British accent, of course. Um, <laughs> Makes you know, it carry more weight. sounded than much better than my, yeah, my right. little, now, me and my redneck accent said, well, would you check someplace else on the camshaft that wasn't ground? Hmm. And they're like, well, okay. And they did. And they come back. I said, well, was, was, was that properly tempered? Yeah, my pinky up. <laughs> um, and they went, well, oddly it was. And I said, 
Hmm. Perchance, could you tell me how? <laughs> Perchance. Perchance. Could yes. you tell me how Redneck. this part of the camshaft was properly tempered and this part wasn't properly tempered? In the same tempering oven. Right. Yeah. It's, it's hung in a tempering oven. It's, you know, I think it's one hour for each inch of thickness, you know, that it was yeah. tempered, you know. So how did, you know, perhaps, you know, would we like to rethink this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so you go back between the Bubba and, the, you know, the, and it's like, well, what happened is they heat treated, you know, in the grinder, mm -hmm. as it created the friction, it took that very top layer and got it hot. But as soon as the grinding wheel left, here comes the stream of coolant that quenched it. It was actually reheat treated unintentionally as part of the grind process. And that reheat treated part didn't get tempered. So that's how you get a temper different on one part of the camp. So the metallurgist was 100% correct. At that microscopic level, less than a millimeter by, like these squares are one millimeter by one millimeter. So 40 thousandths by, yeah. 40 thousandths by 40 thousandths. Mm -hmm. You know, that this little piece, you know, it got brought up to a high enough temperature to, te to transform and then frozen and never got tempered. But globally, it was fine. It was just very locally, it had that issue. Well, I think that's the key thing here is that you've seen this for a long time and you even longer, um, that all these failures that we see at a macro level all began at a microscopic, really atomic level mm -hmm. is where it begins. That right. we really boil it down, that's what it is. So. For just from, per, again, per, per perspective, Billy just said, Mark, explain what these little fun toys are, because these, these are my favorite. I know everything's my favorite, but these are like my most new, favorite. New most favorite. New, 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 new most favorite. New, yes. new most favorite. Yes. Until we come up with something next year that's new. Yeah, th 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 this, is, this is like one of my kids when they're in high school with a new girlfriend. This is my new most favorite girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. These are my new most favorite girlfriends. Yeah. I'm sorry to my wife who's probably not watching. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so these are actual real surfaces blown up. So we have... Um, 3D microscopy. It's a 3D microscope. It's mm -hmm. like our stylus gauge. Only like it's this. Done, it's like mm -hmm. this, only it's done with, you know, a lens. And it's 3D versus 2D. 3D versus 2D. This is one millimeter in terms of area. Take a pen and make a dot on your piece of paper. That's about the size we're looking at. Now, to show some roughness, we scaled everything up and then scaled the height like 20 times more just so we can see the actual surface texture differences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the surfaces we're producing aren't quite as steep, but the features are all there. Right. Mm -hmm. So this makes them a little steeper, but it gives us the ability to play. These six samples in front of us though, mm -hmm. every one of those is in production right now in an engine somewhere. Right. These are all real surfaces. We have a, a standard plateau honed, we have a Nicosil honed, we've got a extremely plateaued. Um, this height difference, if you notice, this one is much taller than the others. All of these samples have a four millimeter base when we 3D printed them. Mm -hmm. So that's saying that there's four millimeters of plastic. Everything else is surface texture. This plasma surface has some wicked deep pores mm -hmm. compared to this plateaued surface and the valleys. So that thickness difference is really a texture difference. Yeah. yeah. So these are the kinds of texture variations we see in the world. And this is where there's no one size fits all. Billy and mm -hmm. I were just talking on the way in about what does my engine want? Well, yeah, well, we talked about, you know, Ben came up with something just off the cuff mm -hmm. that he said it's product, not process. Oh, yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. And that was like, I mean, I'm that that's trademark Ben Strader, but I'm yep. going to steal that 100% mm -hmm. and yes. I, you know, within 1 year that is a Billy statement, not a Ben statement, okay? So. I'm stealing it. Yep. You know, we play with it. We called it, you know, well we talked about a different one. It was the R one. Recipe versus oh. Result. result, yes. So what is that resulting surface? Mm -hmm. But we can extend your and Ben's language even farther. We've got, you know, a million different processes that could produce this. Right. You, you know, rough hone it and then two different grades of fine hone and a brush or whatever to get a geometry. Mm -hmm. We don't know what geometry you're going to want until you put it in an application with a ring, with mm -hmm. loop, with a duty cycle. Mm -hmm this shape may be great for one application, but we need a totally different shape 
somewhere else. Right, because the width of the, re- the, the, the the result, not the recipe. Exactly, that's where I'm going. Yeah, and yes. we were having such fun. out. If y'all had caught us out in the hall, we were laughing. Because <laughs> here, me being a you know, redneck geek, bring up Holy Grail. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know where he's going with this, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Open up the Book of Armaments, <laughs> chapter 6, page 263. Yes. Forget reading for me, brother. <laughs> yeah, yes. Like, oh, the no, holy no. hand grenade for those of you playing along. Yeah, home. the holy yeah. hand grenade that they had a recipe mm-hmm. that, that the number that thou shalt count shall be three. Yes. The, the number shall not be two except to count to three. Shall right. not be four, you know, and five's right out. You know, yes. and the whole thing is you wind up having these religious ways of doing surface finish. It's right. a religious recipe. Right. Thou shalt do this. Yes. And think about it. Why did they need the book of armaments? Well, they didn't understand how a hand grenade worked. Right. Yes. So you had to follow the recipe, and the recipe worked. Then you pass it on because that recipe works, but all of a sudden you start changing things. Yes. Or things degrade. Right. So it's like, I'm going to do this many strokes with a base hone, get my size, and then add a plateau stone to it for this many strokes. Yep. Well, what happens when one of them loads up? Mm. That, was un- that wasn't in my recipe. I don't account right. for that. No. What happens when the machine wears? I start introducing some wobble, some roundness. That's not in the recipe. The block changes. The block changes. Yeah, there's, more, changes. there's different carbides in there. Absolutely. Yeah. Or the <laughs> matrix of the stone changed and we didn't know it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That recipe didn't control it. Right. But the result, it's, we get it. Right. And, it's, uh, you know, and you can see that these, while these results, like this result and this result, looks dramatically different. Yeah. But honestly, you think about these deep grooves here. Yes. And these, you know, voids here. They're both there to hold oil, and yes. they both do a tremendous job of doing that. Right, right. So the result may be even more so, what do you really want the hone? It's not what's the hone, it's what do you want the hone to do, do. and why? Right, what's right. the function? Right. Yes. Yeah. So back, I think back to earlier when, when Brian was on talking about with the DI engine and how much efficiency they lost by going to methanol on port injection oh, yeah. versus you know DI. It was because... Well, we're putting more fuel in the port. So right. it's like, what are we trying to do? What's the goal? Because I may need more void, more valley to hold more oil yes. if I'm running a fuel that is going to be more liquid in form when it comes into the cylinder versus one that is already vaporized because it's a gas like hydrogen. Exactly. I don't need that. I, right. I need something different. Because all I need is just a little bit of lube. I don't need as much seal from yes. that perspective. Because I, I don't have as much fuel working against my seal. And exactly. you really have to think about things as a whole system, too. Because, you know, you go to this DI versus port injection, stuff like that. I guarantee you if we took one of, you know, Ron Shaver's or Andy Durham's 700, 800, 900 horsepower engines. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they don't make any 700s. But take one of their, yeah. you know, 900 horsepower motors. It's not going to be 80 horsepower improved going to DI. Why? Because they've sized the port to have that fuel in there. Right. And now it's not such a big deal. But when you're limited with port size, mm-hmm. like it would be with the LT, mm-hmm. it was designed for a four or 500 horsepower motor. Mm-hmm. When you're trying to make 800 horsepower to that same architecture, every cross section, bit of cross sectional area mm-hmm. is like you're beg, borrowing, and steel for it. And every fuel molecule takes up what you don't have. Right. You take their, you know, if we take, we take Ron or Andy, they have that RY45. Yes. And that architecture will support a thousand horsepower. Easy. So yeah. it's not hurting it to have some fuel in there. Right. So it's a real deal that, that can almost make your head spin. So if you thought recipe is DI makes more power, then you went over here and you went, well, hold on, that didn't work over My here. My results are different way. than this guy's. Yes. Right. Yeah. yeah. My mileage may vary. Your mileage yeah. <laughs> does, will vary. Let's, let's just hang it out there. Yeah. But I think that's been a challenge. Um, we're in a realm right now where it's kind of a cusp of knowledge about surfaces and materials mm-hmm. and the, the sisters working together. Mm-hmm. People are getting tools in their hands that can see these things. Mm. And they're asking the question, what should my surface be? Right. And honestly... A surface is part of a big system, mm. and there is no recipe. And I'm going to pick on Total Seal. Sure. You guys have helped people get into the box really well with mm-hmm. some guidance. Yes. Now we're improving beyond the resolution of your box. Yes. And to direct people where to go from there is tricky because every engine is different now. 
Oh, so true. So, so true. The you know in the world of let's say cylinder bores, we've got RK, RPK, RVK. That gets us in a box. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of performance variation in that box now that we're seeing mm -hmm. that we can improve on. Oh, perfect example. Think about when this summer when you were out at Shavers with with Ron yeah. and, and Don, and we had looked at okay, here's how we've been honing, which yes. has been successful, really? which generates plenty of valley. But now we could take that same block and go over to Brad Lagman and have Brad hone it yeah. and change that valley even more. Right. Change that texture. Yes. And now we pick up four inches of vacuum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We didn't change anything else in the engine. All we just changed was the surface texture. Right. Right. So we're getting better resolution now. We're resolving the surface and seeing mm -hmm. real legit changes. Yes. That's awesome. And I think, you know, our first interaction, first time I met Billy was on, you know, camshafts right. and surface texture and geometry. Mm -hmm. And seeing and controlling a shape differently is mm -hmm. huge. But there's not an easy number for this. We've got to get people using their eyeballs, right? Well, one of the things is to start asking questions. You know, the asking good questions. We talked about this, whether it's on wear or whether this is on ring seal or whatever. You know, a, like if you go to Oak Ridge, you talked about them earlier today. Oh, yeah. And they're going to measure wear resistance. They'll do a, a classic cross-cylinder wear test where mm -hmm. they put two and they just rub them on each other. And the reason you take one rod and rub on this other rod one rod spinning, one rod stationary, and they measure the mass change, and that's how they figure out the wear resistance. Yep. Because they can measure the mass extremely accurately. So, you know, they use that to kind of tell by finding out, see what it actually does. Mm -hmm. The thing is, is that sometimes, even when you've got a thousand PhDs like you taught, <laughs> you have to tell by finding out. You have to do some testing. Well, you know, if you're trying to do something like what we did on camshafts, we looked at camshafts that had failed. We looked at camshafts that had gone a long time without failing. Ones that failed early, what did their surface exactly. contour look like? Yes. Ones that didn't. So you start measuring, you start getting, and the thing is, is that you realize that these engines can solve Schrodinger's equation really quickly compared to me. They know what's going on with their forces. You know, they know what's happening. And so you ask it, what did you like? What did you not like? <laughs> mm -hmm. It's the same thing with the, like we talked about there with the rings. Yeah. You know, when you walk into, when you guys walk into a customer's place and they're going, what, what finish do I want? The right answer would be, well, show me your best engine and show me your, show me your best short block, show me your worst short block, and show me in between. And let's see what, what characterized these differently. Yeah. And then how do we move toward the, everything toward the best, and how do we see what it liked, and maybe it likes a little more of that. Absolutely. So when we talk about that, though, and let's bring it back to kind of surface geometry and, mm -hmm. and metallurgy, is what an engine likes isn't going to be boiled down to a number. Right. No. You know, that number, that surface was, was tempered. Mm -hmm. Well, you got a number for hardness. Yeah, it was but, 62 Rockwell. But is it everywhere? No. And what is the distribution? Is it hard on the edges and soft in the middle? And everything we're dealing with right now that makes this difference doesn't reduce itself to a number like a diameter. Mm. We're in a realm where we're actually getting to be creative. Mm -hmm. We're getting mm -hmm. a little craftsmanship in the game. But we have to understand it's not when this number is high, my parts are bad. And when this number is low, my parts are good. good. Mm. There's more to it to get that last 5% out of systems. Well, back to the other sisters because I think while this is amazing and wonderful and we, and we love it and it's mm -hmm. so critically important these tools are amazing for measuring it yep this is what people there's way more of these out there than I think of these yes. mm -hmm. um, so far in shops and you can measure a surface and have the right numbers it can Absolutely. look correct right but I've seen complete utter failure Yes. Of that surface. Yes. This part's right. The, the numbers are good. Even the picture is good. But when you go begin to look at it, mm -hmm. you can now begin to see right. these, we'll call it, microscopic deviations mm -hmm. in form or geometry. Defects of yeah. some sort. Yes. So we have a whiteboard. So why don't we move over to the whiteboard? Let's do it. My favorite part of the day. 
Yeah. So I, I know you're you're the best at drawing these things. <laughs> oh, by so we're gonna let you do. I'll, I'll, I'll stand over here with Billy. We'll let you draw. So why don't you just kind of draw out quickly? Okay, we've got roughness. Yes. But then we've got waviness, and then yeah. we'll bring in Billy to talk about the actual the contour. Uh, yeah, yeah the well, contour. But I was saying thinking about the metallurgy. Oh, when sure. We start really thinking about those potholes oh, in absolutely. Michigan in January. How do they form? Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Go for so, it. So. Um, the, the, the great analogy I had is when I was um, interested in road texture. Mm. I was driving down the road and I couldn't hear the radio. I thought, I'm going to start figuring out this road roughness thing. So road roughness, in my mind, was the aggregate in the concrete or whatever I'm yeah. driving on. And it's this fine stuff in the road until I Googled it. I was Googling road roughness because I'm a slimy salesman. I'm going to sell, you know, analysis tools. Yeah. <laughs> when I looked at road roughness, everything they were talking about was speed bumps. The suspension industry owns the word roughness in roads, and they call that stuff roughness. Wait a minute. That's roughness in one realm. This is roughness in another realm. Well, let's talk about a crankshaft. Mm -hmm. Crankshaft, you grind it. Yep. You may go in and tape lap it. Mm -hmm. The tape can flex along the way, by the way, and introduce waves. And when you pull one out of an engine, you see stripes. Mm -hmm. That's not roughness. I've had people say, my, my worn out surface has stripes all over it. I got a roughness problem. No, you don't. You have a waviness problem. Mm. So the world of surfaces is a world of wavelengths. And we're going to call some of them roughness. We're going to call some of them waviness. Maybe there's some underlying geometry that we'll call. Now, in, in the standard language, we call this roughness, waviness, and form. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes form is intentional. We want to put some relief in. And that's where, right. you know, you guys are kings of this. So I'll hand that to Billy when we talk about intentional form. Right. But this is a form error, if you will, a mm -hmm. straightness problem. This gauge over here, the skidded roughness gauge, only sees this stuff. Right. Let's make sure we focus on that for a second. Yeah. This, this thing's wonderful. Roughness. It's but a roughness it, it gauge. does this. Yes. It doesn't do this. So if you see stripes on a part, you know, you pull something out of an engine, you look at a, a bearing on a crankshaft, um, bearing on a camshaft. Mm -hmm. If you can see stripes that are 40 thousandths apart, mm -hmm. that's waviness. You don't have a roughness problem. You've got to start looking deeper. By the way, waviness problems are why we have noise with gears. Waviness problems are why gaskets don't seal. Yeah. We spend a lot of time in roughness because it matters, especially to tribologists. Yep. But this is where some of our big failures live. So um, some systems can tolerate this. Uh, crank bushing can bend and follow some form, but it can't bend for this. Think of our surface like a symphony. We've got mm -hmm. high notes and low notes. We need to control the ones that matter to whatever you're working on. So that's our spectrum. We call this roughness, we call this waviness, and we would call this kind of form error. Mm -hmm. We can do intentional things with form to make things better, though. If you want to... Yeah, I'll, I'll give it a yeah, shot. Please, go for it. I'll give a shot at it here. I'm going to try a little red one up here. For All the, right, it's going to get a little red now. This is the roller wheel right here. And people look at a roller wheel, so the axle's up here. Here's just the face of it. So... And this thing actually is made with a little bit of crown on it. So it's a radius over here. Now when you take your camshaft surface, it's a mountain range. And what you would see is you put higher loads on these peaks here. That these loads, and what a failure is, by failure by definition, is when the applied force is greater than the material strength. Repeat that one more time, please. Whenever the applied force on to any microscopic piece of steel or any other material is greater than its material strength, Yes. it by definition fails. So what I think is interesting there is you come out of engineering school and you've done tensile tests and you've done compression tests and stuff, and people think of that macro. Mm -hmm. They think I'm going to load this with you know, several tons. What you're saying is that applies micro. Right. It applies down here at the atomic level. It is at the iron lattice level. Yes. When the applied force is greater than material strength, this lattice breaks. And right. then that crack propagates. And we'll get to there. So what people did goes, hey, look, these little peaks get more loaded in the valleys. Yes. We're going to polish this. Well, the problem is when they polished it, they wound up with something that wound up smoother, but 
kind of often wavy. Yes. Well, the problem with this is now when we eh, now when we apply this force, well, this guy over here is not seeing much. This isn't seeing much, but all of a sudden we put a lot of force here and here. Yes. On the tops of those waves, and this is where we wound up going. Ooh, polishing. You can't fix something with polishing. And especially if you already had a bad contour to begin with, you get a worse contour. Now where the highest deal is this edge loading, because here on the edge of this track, here and here, you start putting things in tensile strength. You're actually trying, you know, you've got force coming up here, force going down here. Yes. You're creating a shear plane. You're causing a lot of tensile there. That's why you see mostly edge failures on camshafts. Well, let's pause there because even if you had perfection, mm -hmm. A perfectly square and flat surface into another perfectly flat surface. Yep. The stress contribution, or the Is, stress concentration, does one of these things. Yep. Edges are going to load even in the world of perfection. Oh, absolutely. And then you go in here, and this case depth is yes. only so far deep. Right. And then all of a sudden, this creates this crack in here, and then it comes out, and this throws a chunk out of it just like a pothole on a road mm -hmm. right. where you get a crack that starts subsurface starts down in here yes. and then cracks and propagates around then throws out and starts what's called a technically it's a spalling failure yeah and that's what not spalding like the you know ball but spalling <laughs> failure and this spalling failure is what you see normally this is the pits that you see come up you'll see it on the nose of flat taps if they're out of control where they throw up and then crash down yeah. that bottom of that 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 surface flexed this mm -hmm. put this part in tension at the bottom of the heat treat crack there and goes up from the bottom up. But I think that's an interesting point when we start talking about geometry and form, mm -hmm. is perfect isn't always perfect. No. We need to relieve those edges because perfect is bad. Right, so you look at <laughs> right. what used to happen over time was that camshafts never were all that flat because the grinding wheels mm -hmm. were relatively soft. And so when the grinding wheel was grinding the lobe, right. it would wear away and it create this convex shape on the lobe, which is actually yes. very beneficial. 100%, yes. When you went to CNC's with CBN's, they started to get really, really flat. Yes. And the problem is when you miss from flat, you wind up with what you call this form, this bathtub shape. And what we found when we started doing investigations was if we ever had waviness, we failed here and here. If we ever had bathtub shapes, we failed here and here. Exactly. And it was a big exploration of what's going on. So instead, well, what do you do if you're failing there? Well, you grind it with that type of shape. Yes. Now, the problem is when you have that type of shape against this type of shape, you know, enough is good. <laughs> but too much, and then you start loading concentration here. Yeah. And if you look at other side, if you look at like a GM camshaft, if you pull a um, you know late '90s, early 2000s GM camshaft out of an LS type engine, Gen 3 engine, you'll see a stripe around the base circle. The track will be very, very narrow. Crown on crown. Well, why they have a crown on crown? If yeah. you don't load it, it doesn't spread out. And then the load is what spreads out. So you look at the flank where it's more loaded, it spreads it out. When you know you've got the right geometry. In the highly loaded areas, it'll be narrower. You know, if you look at a camshaft lobe, and here, so that's a camshaft lobe, okay? And the high exactly loaded, like one, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Yeah. So what you'd see is something that that starts out kind of narrow, and then winds out, and then yep. narrows out. And so the wear pattern should look kind of coke bottle shaped, kind of like this. Mm -hmm. When it's really defined on the edges, it's not enough crown. When it's too narrow. It's low on the crown. Well, I think what you're pointing out, Billy, is really interesting to many of the people in our audience, is they're not going to have an ad coal machine yeah. or a skidless roughness gauge. And getting this idea of what does the shape tell me mm. is going to be a big deal. Do I have tracks running down the edges? Well, what geometry causes that? How can I fix that in the process? Mm -hmm. um, do I see stripes or not? Do I see an edge loaded or not? That being the forensic doctor looking at you know, post-test mm -hmm. is almost our better process control because the tools to do this in process can be expensive for a lot of people. Oh, yeah. Well, the other thing is, like, you can't go and mic this and see it either. Exactly. Because if you go in here, this crown 
you know, it's, you know, on the order of like a 100-inch, 200-inch crown. Yeah. So you go in here, it's only half a thousandth drop on either side. So if you could possibly get over there and mic the very edge, then mic the center, then mic the edge, you might see it. But the problem is it's really hard to mic the very yeah. absolute edge. edge. Yeah. So without something like a profilometer, and that's where you came in and helped us bring all this in. Right. But I guess there's just there's just more to it. You know, and sometimes just knowing there's more to it is part of one of the big parts of the battle, right? I, that's the whole point of having this segment. Exactly. Is, yeah, knowledge is power. Even knowing that it's there, to be able to even begin to say, okay, well, roughness is this. There is this thing called waviness, and there's form, and they are related, and that yeah. how they all factor in so that now you have maybe a, more, a better calibrated eye for when you're looking at the used parts as they come out of the engine, because they're going to tell you this kind of story so that you know what you're looking at and you're not just having to speculate off of what somebody else may have said on the Internet. You can actually look at it with a trained eye and say, OK, now I understand what I'm what I'm seeing. And you know what the funny thing is about all of these issues that we've studied? If you get on the internet and you see a camshaft that's failed, they're going to say, oh, they bought some cheap steel out of Asia. Yeah. Right. <laughs> this has nothing to do with the steel of the setup. This doesn't have right. anything to do with, oh, the heat treat, oh, this. This is all about processing. Yes. You know, so you've got all of this going on, and then you go back to the whole deal of, you know, now what can we do with the heat treat afterwards? <laughs> what can we do to hurt things? You know, somebody go in there... Valve springs are notorious about this. I take out a box of failed springs and I see somebody's fingerprints and rust on them. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Well, I know why it failed. It wasn't anything other than it rusted because if you imagine this, this valve spring wire, you know, and say it's a 200 thousandths diameter wire. Well, all of the stress, and we're just going to play with this is the ID, that's OD. The stress concentration is right in here. Mm hmm just right on that ID. Mm -hmm. Well, they've gone in and done all this painting to drive this compressive stresses all into this setup. So they've gone in with little balls that came in here real fast and crushed down this surface. And Making it more dense. And yes. so what they did, if you imagine the iron lattice with all these little FEs. That's not Fifi the French poodle. No, this that's, isn't that's Fifi. Not. This is like iron. And what they do is when they hit it, they actually scooch these guys in toward each other and pack them in. And that's why... Taking the iron atoms and, that's, and just collapsing them And if you ever heard somebody said, oh, how'd you test that? Well, I did an x-ray. I checked the hardness with the x-ray. Well, an x-ray doesn't tell you how hard it is. No. Not directly. No. It just tells you how close these iron, these iron atoms, atoms are to each other. Yeah. So that's what the diffraction of it is. Is this? If it, so you've got all of this stuff where you bounce it off, you compacted these iron closer together. Well, that's only about, you know, just a few thousandths deep, maybe ten thousandths if you're lucky. Well, you can go here, put touch this, and if you've got the wrong pH, you can put an etch that goes down here below this. Then all of that's gone. Mm -hmm. yeah. And your safety net's gone, and it's going to break. You know, people go, oh, well, you want me to just buy new rusted springs, you know, to, make, to sell more springs. Dude, you're going to buy more springs. Yes. Did you have to buy a new cylinder head and piston and everything else because the spring rusted and then it's the eight of valve? Yeah. You know, the spring's going to get bought. It's going to fail. Right. I mean, which is back to why rust protection is so incredibly important that if yes. today's world with oxygenated fuels, yes. drag racing, any kind of stuff, you really have to be paying close attention. When you see rust on something, you have a problem that you really need to address because it can cause way more damage than you might and think about. And it's not just brush off the rust and I've got clean metal. No, no you've because created, the damage is below what you're seeing. Right. Yes. You've created that, that damage and you've gotten rid of anything that you've done positive to the surface, whether it's a connecting rod or whether it's a valve spring, it's gone. Yes. And if it's a crankshaft or a camshaft, that rust has gone in there and just, t it's so big compared to all this that it's, you know, it's a monster. And, that, and that's just talking about a spring. Yes. That's which I know there's a lot of processing that goes into a spring mm -hmm. because of how stressed it is. Well, its mass is its own worst enemy. You know, so about, you know, people don't realize that probably more than 30% of the spring load isn't to control the valve, it's to control the coils of the spring. 
So wow. people like go, well, how much? I get a question at least once a week. How much spring load do I need? Well, I can't. If you had nitrogen springs, and I knew everything about the cam. Yeah, I could tell you. But really, the spring load, most of the spring load's there. That's why you see somebody with a little bitty spring mm -hmm. that's got 600 pounds open and somebody with a 1-300 spring. Then you see a guy with one 650 spring that's got 750, 900 pounds open. Why does he have to have so much more overload? Well, it's to control the big, fat, heavy spring. Wow. You know, the coils themselves, it's a, on load is all it has to control that. Yeah. So, well, so as we kind of wrap up our surface module here, what I'm finding is, is interesting from my perspective is you know, I live in a geometry space, and you know, you guys are living in a you know lubrication, tribology space, material space. These are all you know married tightly. Mm -hmm. Almost every one of these things, though, doesn't reduce itself to look it up in a book. Mm -hmm. No, where the books are there, but it's that experience. And it would be great to do a session like this of the Hall of Shame someday. <laughs> you know, here's, here's a part that you know got rusty and it destroyed it, or here's a part that we thought was perfect, but the edge is loaded. Mm -hmm. And it's a case where to let people know that there's information hiding in that surface yes. or in that engine that you're not going to be able to Google. Right. Mm. But and don't be intimidated more, by it. And the Dig more in. you measure, the more measurements yeah. you take, the better you're going to get. You're going to increase your own tribal knowledge. You're going to understand your parts better. So measure, 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 measure. Yeah, and I, I think I would probably <laughs> it says metrology right on my shirt, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, but I'm yeah. not. I'm not going to go there. I would say explore. Mm hmm. Because mm -hmm. that you know is this really yes. measuring? I think it's exploring. Mm. And don't feel stupid. Feel like you know an explorer. You know yeah. you're going somewhere no one has gone before. Nobody has looked at your part right. in the way you're looking at it. And be an explorer. Um, don't feel intimidated by it, right? There's a lot of weird settings in math and measuring systems. Yeah. Don't be burdened by that. Dig in and look around. Yeah. So we talked about it. Measuring is super important and learning is super important, which is why we have another video coming up for you right now. What a day, what a day, what a day. My, yeah, my, brain, my brain is swollen. I've learned so much today. He told us, don't start cars, we are not going to listen.